Perta Chingon. Is that how you say it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You didn't say that with confidence. Perta Chingon. <laughs> how do you think you say it? I'm asking you. I don't know how you say it. That's the English version. That's, that's, that's it. Perta Chingones. Whoa. Flies four. I'm Russell Miller, and we're going to be talking about Euro patterns. Sitting next to me is Lance Egan, Umqua signature designer, uh, fly shop employee with Fly Fish Food, longtime Team USA guy, and generally fishy, fishy guy. Uh, we're really excited to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, Lance, uh, where are you in from? And Just what? flew in from Salt Lake, uh, in town for a show in Denver here, and uh, happy to chat and Got an opportunity to stop by Umqua and, and have a chat with you about some flies and, and hopefully uh, also enjoy the show a little bit. Love it. Yeah, thanks for making the time to be here. Easily done. So home waters out of Salt Lake, where do you normally fish? Oh, I fish lots of places. I spend a lot of time on the Provo River. I spend a lot of time at uh, Strawberry Reservoir, and there's tons of small streams and lots of lakes in the surrounding area I spend a lot of time in. I also venture into Idaho and Wyoming a little bit, Colorado a little bit. And I like to travel a little when I have time and finances to do it, right? Exactly. Uh, quite diverse. Yeah, you guys are pretty lucky in Salt Lake. You've got a lot of stuff very touchable um, in we a short do. drive. We have a lot of uh, species yeah, diversity for sure. Uh, you know, trout-centric for sure, but I love fishing for carp. We have lots of bass available. Um, I chase some strange fish like lake trout at times, uh, tiger muskie, all kinds of opportunities there for sure. Like lake trout, lake trout. Yeah, yeah, big lake trout. <laughs> Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, well, as far as the Umqua family goes, when was your, you remember getting your first pattern into Umqua? About what time? What was it? I don't remember exactly the year, early 2000s, maybe 2001, 2002, something like that. Uh, my first pattern was the Rainbow Warrior, glass beaded Rainbow Warrior for sure. Uh, you know, I don't know how much story time we want to go into, but the, the story there was I, I created the pattern. Uh, fished them on the Provo one day, caught a lot of fish on them, went back to the shop. I was working for a shop in Salt Lake at the time, uh, Fish Tech, still around, great shop. Um, and I had told Mickey and Byron, the owners at the time, uh, you know, I caught all these, all these fish on this fly, and they'd heard that a million times from a million different people. They are like, oh yeah, cool, you know, tie us a few. So I tied a few dozen, threw them in the bins, and sold them to a few customers. Customers came back for more. And that process repeated itself for about six to eight months where I tied like 130 something dozen for the shop and couldn't keep up. And then a uh, long time rep for Umqua way back when, Van Rolo was our sales rep. And uh, at the time they had a, Umqua had a program where, which they still do, right? But they had a program where you could custom do flies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we said, we have this pattern that we can't keep in stock. Um, we need you to do a custom order. And he said, well, you got to make sure you have to, there's minimums, you got to do at least 10 mm. dozen per size. And, you know, we're like, 10, okay, yeah. And he's like, you can do that? Oh, yeah, easy, no problem. He's like, well, how many are you going to sell? I said, well, I, the only reason I know exactly how many I sold is because of the way that they paid me for them is I wrote them in a little notebook so we could go back and tally exactly how many I tied. So, yeah, 133 dozen, I think, was the exact number in the last few months. He's like, oh, well, that's that's a winner. Maybe we just need to put it in the catalog. And I, what, what's, what does that mean, you know? And, so that's how that process started. Uh, so the Rainbow Warrior was my first commercially available fly. Awesome. What was everyone's reaction when they first saw the Warrior? Because it's not your regular looking nymph. Uh, what? What do you mean it's not I a mean, it's, a, it's on a hook and a bead. I understand that, but <laughs> it's quite the body. It's a strange one for sure. It's all flash. Uh, I don't know. Most people, as I recall, it was a long time ago, right? But as I recall, <laughs> most people were hesitant. It's different. It's flashy. Um, one of the comments I get about I, I got about it a lot, I guess the first maybe decade it was around was, does it work for wild fish? Because people look at it and they mm. think it's just a stocked fish fly. And I always laughed at that because uh, for me, I don't uh, we don't have non-stocked fish in our rivers, basically. They, they very, do very little stocking of fish in Utah rivers. So, so they're almost all wild fish. So to me, it was kind of designed and was born and bred around only wild fish. So, wild German brown trout. So, yeah, German browns, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, does it catch stockfish? It absolutely does, but it, it uh, shines to me as a wild fish, you know, type of fly as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's bright, it's flashy, the fish can't miss it for sure. 
Uh, and now, as you know, it's available in lots of options mm -hmm. from glass beaded to tungsten beaded to tungsten bead with lead wire, extra heavy version, jigged versions, Paragon versions, CDC versions, CDC versions, all kinds of stuff, yeah. different colors, black, red, purple. It's awesome. The pearl. Yeah. The original was the pearl. It's kind of become a staple in a lot of people's boxes at this point, which yeah. is super cool to see. Certainly a staple in mine. Um, the other thing uh, we mentioned briefly, but you're a competing member of Team USA. Uh, you've been doing that for more than a season. Yeah, 20 years to be exact. 2023 was, uh, was my 20th year and uh, a long time. It's quite a run. Yeah, it was to a long, say the least. It's a long time for sure. The commitment as far as getting that done and just seeing different waters, different fishing scenarios and all that stuff. Like, I'm curious, how does that process of competing influence a lot of the flies that were kind of laying on the table in front of us and uh, influence you as a fly designer? Uh, well, it, it's an interesting thing because uh, I think competition fishing is, is very misunderstood as far as I think most people paint it into a corner and think it's only nymphing. And to be successful at competition nymphing, Russ is being coy here for us. He, he knows a lot about competition fishing, right? But, but if, uh, for our benefit, he's, he's taking one for the team. Competition fishing, uh, it, of course, a large part of his nymphing, as you know. Trout do more than 90% of their feeding subsurface, so that's a big deal. But to be really successful at competition fishing, you have to be able to fish streamers, you gotta be able to fish dries, you gotta be able to fish dry dropper. You're, you need to be able to adapt to every situation that's, that you're thrown into, right? And so with that, the fly selection and your fly, um, your fly designs, I think, have to be tailored to each of those techniques. You know, flies that might be, the ideal weight for a nymph rig may be a little too heavy for a dry dropper. Um, a regular strip streamer doesn't need to be as heavy or as dense or maybe as fast sinking as a, a fly that you're going to use as a jig streamer and so on. So there's certainly parts of the competition scene that play into fly design and um, because you have to be really well-rounded, well I think it allows you to kind of create flies that are both great for dry fly fishing, great for nymphing, great for streamers, great for dry dropper, even swinging wets, all those types of things come into play. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I've always admired throughout the years of watching you compete and tie flies in the evenings, preparing for the next day is what's on the table, what's commercially available. It's the same pattern that's in your fly box. Like it, it's, it's always funny to me. I'll watch you tie up a new row of surveyors or something going into a competition, and mm. you're just like, Lance has got to have a million surveyors. But <laughs> you know, this one's maybe a little thinner, or a little bit bigger bead, or a little extra. But it's yeah, or fresh. Uh, in a competition, I'm funny about hooks fresh. and a fresh. I don't want a hook that's already bounced off a few rocks. I, I need it could be in the box, but if it's been in the box for a while and I don't know exactly what shape the hook's in, or I know exactly how dense that particular bead, batch of beads mm -hmm. is, or something like that. You know, you know how competition fishing is. It gets a little, uh, a little uh, outlandish, I guess, yeah. a little unruly at times. But for most of us, it doesn't matter on your regular day out if, if it's a different batch of beads or something, not too crucial, right? You work at Fly Fish Food, and obviously you have a lot of people coming in asking for what bugs are working where. I assume they're not going out competing. They're looking for a bug that's going to bring them success out on the water, regardless of what they're going to do. Put it under a dry, yeah. put it under an indicator. You know, Egan patterns work uh, in a lot of different scenarios. It's cool to see something that really was born out of the comp world just bleed directly into the consumer market and have that demand there behind it. Right. Yeah, and some flies, uh, like the Rainbow Warrior, I wasn't competing at that time, right? So Rainbow Warrior wasn't born that way. Surveyor, same way. Uh, but a lot of flies that are competition style flies uh, don't have to be, they're not limited obviously to competition fishing. You know, a, a red dart, a blue dart, uh, red Frenchies, standard Frenchies are some of my go-tos just as a dropper below a dry. Uh, even, you know, if you're drift boat fishing and just pounding banks with a big dry and a dropper, those are money patterns for that. Uh, the corn fed caddis is one of my favorite flies to for any caddis hatch. It's buoyant, it's easy to see. Uh, is it a competition fly? I don't think so. Uh, to me, it's just a standard dry fly. We use it in competition, but it doesn't have to be, a, you know, only that, narrowed mm -hmm. down to just that. Competition style flies often to me are, like you were kind of saying, they're, uh, they're oversized beads, they're heavy. That would be something I would call a comp only fly. But even then, I mean, if you're throwing a big chubby, an oversized, you know, on a big Montana river or something, an oversized thread Frenchie with a giant bead head like that, 
it's is, a winner. It's a winner. It gets down, and if you're throwing a you know big buoyant piece of foam and poly, it's not going to sink that anyway. It just gets down to where the fish live. So there's lots of. Um, I, to me, I don't like calling them comp flies because they're there's like four people that compete and. <laughs> The rest of us are just fishing for fun. So they're, they're just flies, right? And even if it is a comp fly, the reason it's a comp fly is because it needs to catch fish. That is, that is the criteria to be successful mm -hmm. at competition fishing. And it's what we're all striving for every time we're out fishing anyway, is just to catch some fish, right? So if you have flies that look something like something that trout want to eat, that are getting to the right depth, and you can present them in a natural manner, whatever that may be, that's the key to success. Check all the boxes Check all that. the boxes. Well, with that, let's talk about some of the signature Egan patterns and dive into some of the origin stories and how you like to fish them uh, in this next little segment here. Okay. Yeah, so we picked a few kind of my favorites. Um, maybe let's start down deep and work to the surface. How's that work? Love it. So uh, one of my favorite flies that I fish a lot are Frenchies, thread Frenchies or standard Frenchies. Thread Frenchies are all uh, on jig hooks. They are available in a, in a range of sizes and colors. We have them in olive and brown and in black. Um, they've all got a little hot spot on them, but they're they're kind of a blend between a, a dub nymph and a peritone. They have kind of the peritone uh, abdomen, but a thorax that's dubbed in your hot spot. So they still sink really quick. They're really durable. Uh, they just get down. Uh, to me, the, the original there was the standard Frenchie with the pheasant tail body. We all know how much trout like pheasant tail. It's some sort of, it's like, you know, pheasant tail and peacock curl or a couple of magic materials that are natural, right? And pheasant tail Frenchies just flat work. That, the fish love them. We have those in a jig version and on a standard hook. So if you're not into a barbless hook, we've got you covered. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll work well on a nymph rig, on an indicator rig, on a euro rig, dry dropper. We have people that fish them on lakes all the time too, either slow stripping them or even hanging them below an indicator. All that stuff can work really well. Um, they will also sink quite quickly. The, uh, the, the regular Frenchies with the pheasant tail also have a lead wire underbody, so they do get down mm -hmm. quite well. They do, they do. Our factories tie quite a few of those. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. We do all right with the Frenchie. Frenchie's a good one. Yeah, where, did, good where, did you, where did you first develop the Frenchie? So the, the, my version of a Frenchie, uh, I first came up with in, in Nationals, like in 2005, 2006. Um, I, used the, I used it in a World Championship in Portugal in 2006 for the first time. Uh, won my, my very, that was my very first World Championship, and I won a session on the, on the River Alva, fishing a bionic ant with a Frenchie dropper. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it was cool. They, it had just rained, and our, our guide, uh, Jorge Pisco, had told us all, it hadn't rained all during pre-fishing, but it just rained, and he said, after rain, ants, you gotta fish ants. And I had this big foam ant, it was kind of my, uh, uh, you know, as ants go large, it was like a 12. Uh, so I threw that on, and the fish started eating it, and, and then when I get into deeper runs, I'd hang a little dropper behind it, and the Frenchie was the magic, and I'd only produced seven fish, but it was enough to take a, a win, I think, of like around 30 anglers, that was the most caught in that session. And so those two kind of got etched into my, my brain as far as, <laughs> These are, these are winning flies. I feel like the Frenchie's been inched into everyone's mind as a winning fly that just gets it done. A little bit of a hot spot to like attract fish to it, but then that nice kind of, as you said, magic material, pheasant tail body. Yeah, most people fish the pheasant tail, a standard pheasant tail, right? Some, uh, some additions to this or some improvements, I guess I would dare say. Uh, the tail is Coque de Leon on these, so it's much more durable than your standard pheasant mm -hmm. tail tail. Um, it's easier to tie, quicker to tie, which I like. I'm, I'm not a... You know me, we've spent lots of hours at the tying desk in the evenings at over comps, but uh, I like to crank out flies as fast as I can, and uh, that fly without all the peacock and without the wing cases and legs and everything else that you add to a pheasant tail, it's just a much quicker tie, and I think the hot spot actually even is more effective. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Awesome. Uh, well, let's see. Let's move on. So we talked a little bit about the Rainbow Warrior. Again, available in lots of versions. Uh, personally, I end up fishing the Peritagon or the CDC version the most currently. Um, I've also fished just the standard Tungsten Rainbow Warrior for a long time. That's a staple in my mm -hmm. box. Lots of versions available. Uh, I think some of the sneaky ones that are lesser known, lesser sold in that series are actually the black and the red versions of the Rainbow Warrior. Uh, when are you putting on black versus red versus the pearl? 
who knows? Black for me is, uh, I mean, pearl's the standard for me. That's when I, I usually fish the most. Red, uh, in my home waters, red is really effective in, let's say, late March, April, and May in our tailwater fisheries. For whatever reason, they seem to like red midge patterns, if you will. And so tying a red rainbow warrior in a 18, 20, 22 is very, very effective. Uh, black for me is more wintertime, midge pupa, mm -hmm. midge larva type fly. Um, but it can work all the time. It can, it can. Well, midges are just in the system constantly. Always there. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, the Rainbow Warrior, though, is a staple. Uh, there's a couple of differences in some of the versions, too, where the standard has a pheasant tail tail. The uh, Peridone version, we're back to Coke de Leon mm -hmm. again. Durability is kind of what I was looking for in that pattern. The Warrior one just, the per Warrior Peridone just looks mean, too. It's yeah. a great looking bug. Flashy, fish can't miss yeah. it, right? Uh, and it sinks like a rock and is really durable. Yeah, if we moved on uh, using that same kind of colorway, in fact, a lot of people mistake this one, the Tungsten Surveyor, that's one of my lesser known flies, and it's actually had kind of a, a funny uh, love-hate relationship with Umqua. It, Umqua took it on early, discontinued it because it didn't sell, and then brought it back later. Um, very rare for Umqua to do. It was weird, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it got added and then subtracted and added again. Um, I, it, I'd have to look at the numbers, but I don't think it sells a ton still. But for me, it's one of those sleeper flies that um, a lot of people mistake it for Rainbow Warrior because it does have the rainbow dubbing. But instead of the tinsel body, it's a dubbed body. Uh, when I created it, I had, I had already done the Rainbow Warrior. And uh, at the time, I was fishing a lot of Rainbow Warriors and standard hare's ears. And so this was kind of the original versions of this were basically a hare's ear tied with rainbow dubbing, if you will. Hmm. And then in different iterations, I changed the tail a little bit, kind of more to the rainbow warrior tail. I changed from gold wire or gold ribbing on a hare's ear to the silver, seemed to match the, the mm -hmm. lighter colored body better. Um, I almost always fished hare's ears in flashback, so it always had the flashback. Uh, the red thread underneath that rainbow sow scud dubbing just seems to, there's something magic about that when the fly is wet. It, which looks yeah. cool. So that one kind of evolved. It also started with a gold bead and uh, evolved to a silver bead. I think it fishes better with the silver bead. To me, the surveyor works really well anywhere there are scuds, anywhere there are sow bugs, and it works really as just a general attractor too. Um, it's a fly that I've won many a competition session with, uh, even in places where there are no sow bugs or you know places mm -hmm. where uh, I've fished it in some Montana rivers where all the local guide shops are like, you need stones and you need prince nymphs and you need you know this and that. And you put one of those on and the fish can't leave it alone. Well, I, think, I feel like the name is so fitting. You can survey the river with it, it and is, see what's going to be biting. That is why we named it that, the Tungsten Surveyor. It gets down, the fish love it. I think, I think that's one of the unheralded, that's one of, one of the, my patterns I feel like is lost, that, that not very many people use that they probably should. Well, if you love fish and hares ears, I think this is a great variation to be able to pick up and put in your box and put on. Right, yeah. The original, uh, we were calling it the first you know, year and a half I was fishing it with some friends. We called it the rainbow hare's ear, basically. Mm. But tungsten surveyor is a little more fitting. I like surveyor. Yeah, moving on, uh, if we get into the dart series. So the red dart is uh, the staple there for me. The red dart with the red tail, uh, darker kind of peacock, mm -hmm. ice dub colored body, little soft tackle. Looks exactly like everything in the bottom of the river. <laughs> uh, no, looks, looks nothing like anything in the river, right? But it, it is a pure attractor. Uh, it has a hot spot. It's got the crazy red tail. That is a fly that, for me, replaced the Prince Nymph. I used to use Princes a lot. I tied almost all my Princes for the last 10 years I fished Prince Nymphs. I tied them with a red thread collar. I just kind of liked that mm -hmm. hot spot on them. Uh, this fly, I don't really even have Princes in my box anymore. I'm not suggesting they don't work because Princes work for mm -hmm. sure. But I just kind of replaced this, that, that fly with this fly. The red dart for me, uh, if I'm in a new water, it's one of the first things I try because the fish will either pounce on it or totally leave it alone and you learn that pretty quick. Um, I wonder, I don't know what the fish eat it as, nobody does obviously. I sometimes wonder if they think it's a small minnow when it's drifting along. Mm. Only, and then my only reason for that is it looks, actually there's two reasons for that. It looks nothing like any nymph that I've ever seen. The red tail I think could m maybe maybe look like a little red side shiner or something like that. But the other reason I think that it's maybe eaten as a small minnow is the takes often are kind of savage. You, you could fish it below a dry and the dry just gets murdered. You know, it gets, mm -hmm. It's pulled under not just a little hesitation in the dry, it disappears completely. Uh, they eat it really hard sometimes. Uh, I also, you can do pretty well on it just twitching it a little bit, making it look a little animated. Dancing can work really it, so well. To speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of those crazy flies. 
we show it to people all the time uh, in the shop and they're like, Okay, you I'll know, take one. I've been using zebra midges, and you show me this size 14 <laughs> tungsten beaded, you know, conglomeration of materials. And uh, for whatever reason, the fish like it. I don't really know why. And then it's available in a couple other colors the blue version, the purple version, a range of sizes as well. They fish great on a Euro rig. You can fish them below an indicator. Some of our locals really love fishing them in lakes too, mm. really popular lake fly. I know the larger sizes of the blue dart get used a lot for uh, Great Lakes steelhead too on nymph rigs. That's kind of a sleeper there. Otherwise, all three colors, pure attractor. Um, they're dense. They get down well. Uh, I use them a lot on, an, on a Euro rig, but I also fish them dry dropper quite a bit. Mm, great. Yeah. Well, let's go, since we're still subsurface, let's go streamer. This is uh, a new fly from Umqua, the, the poacher. Um, kind of a, a newer version, if you will, of a pine squirrel type of leech. Mm -hmm. uh, pine squirrel tail, uh, a dubbed body to create a bit more silhouette, uh, and then a soft tackle to create even more bulk towards the head. Uh, rather than making a big, really dense body, I wanted something that sinks really quickly. And uh, I use this fly most uh, on a Euro rig, jigging it as a streamer. So casting it in, letting it get to depth. And then as it's drifting along, giving it the, the a little twitch here and there. Popping it up and down. Mm -hmm. So it has to be really dense. So some people I've had ask, well, what, what's different about this than, say, like another popular umpqua pattern that's similar is, um, is uh, Mayer's Mini Leech, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a great fly. And this is, to me, it's different in a couple of ways. One, it's significantly more dense. It's, it's designed for a whole different purpose. Uh, it has to get down really deep. Landon would usually fish his leeches on an indicator rig where he's adding extra weight to get them down. And where I'm not adding that extra weight, I'm using this as the weight. It's significantly more dense. What size bead is on these? That one is a 4.6 mil. Uh, they range in the, the size range from a 4 mil to 4.6. Which is, that's a lot of bead. It's a lot of bead. And then there's lead wire under the body as well mm -hmm. to make them even more dense. Uh, so yeah, they, they just fish different than most other pine squirrel patterns, if you will. Uh, available in black and in olive. Uh, I end up fishing the olive very, very most. In really cold water, the black one can be very good. And then uh, one, one little hot tip, I guess, for me, one sleeper. This is designed as a, a Euro streamer to jig, but this, both this black version and the olive version for me are staples on a strip streamer rig to trailing something larger. Put a sparkle minnow or put a you know, some sort of zonker, something that's flashy or bigger in front of it and three or four feet behind it hang a little olive or a little black poacher behind it, and then just let them clean up the, the fish. I've even fished this single out of the boat uh, to For the sure. bank when you get a lot of those chasey, nippy, mm -hmm. that don't commit, and you just go to a single one of these, yeah. fishing some of that riprap, because it gets like... Straight down. Right down mm -hmm. where you want into that strike zone, and yeah. you can twitch it right out. And... Yeah, half the time they'll eat it just as it's falling, right? Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah, really dense, fun pattern, easy to tie, no problem at all. All right, good fun. And then moving to the surface... Uh, the corn-fed caddis, that thing is bulky, it is, uh, it's buoyant, it's pretty easy to see. The corn-feds for me, uh, these, are, these are old flies too. This fly has been around a long time, it just kind of more recently in the last four or five years has caught on a little bit sales-wise. Um, I used it in my first world championship in 2007 in Finland, uh, catching mostly grayling and brown trout on it. It's for me, I call it the corn-fed caddis because at the time I felt like most CDC patterns were really um, sparse, you know, limited dressing to be very imitative, to be, uh, you know, Spring Creek type flies. Mm -hmm. And one of my things I didn't like about CDC patterns, most commercially available patterns at the time, was that in a lot of my waters where I fished, it's high gradient, bouncy, pockety stuff where you know, throwing something that's designed for a Spring Creek just doesn't stay floating very You're going to drown it immediately. Yeah. So the, the corn fed is kind of a, a version of a CDC caddis pattern that just has bulk to it. That's why we call it corn fed, right? It's husky. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is just one of those flies that you can fish by itself. You can hang a, you know, you wouldn't want to hang a four mil bead below it, but you could hang a two, two and a half, mm -hmm. even maybe a three mil bead behind it and uh, fish dry dropper style, and it does really well with that. I also love, uh, you know, f shaking it, uh, twitching it with a, a dropper. If you tie the, the dry fly and a dropper, instead of tying to the bend of the hook, if you tie your tippet uh, on a tag from off the main line to your dry and then have 
this on a tag end, you can have that, that nymph be kind of an anchor point and bounce this caddis. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk about how, how to rig off tags just for general fishing mm -hmm. uh, as we get into kind of that technique section and gear section. Cool. Because I think that's a really cool thing to explore that people maybe aren't aren't keen to yet. For sure, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of anglers don't take advantage of droppers, for sure. The corn fed, though, available in uh, olive and tan and a new color in peacock. Um, and then standard and rubber leg too. Standard and rubber leg versions as well. Yes, uh, it's just a buoyant fly fish. Love it. One cool thing about CDC too is it has the appearance of bulk, silhouette of bulk, but it, it allows fish. Everything's soft. It's not. There's no rigid hackle. There's a CDC hackle, but there's mm -hmm. no rigid stiff rooster hackle. There's no rigid stiff deer or elk hair. So when you've normally fished like an elk hair caddis and you find the fish love eating it, they, they love eating yeah. elk hair, but they miss it a lot. This one, they get in their mouth much, much easier. So everything will get slicked down it's and soft. get drawn in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of one of those competition tricks, right? Where every fish counts. You don't want to miss one of those fish on a dry. You need to get them to eat it and, and commit and get it in there. Mm -hmm. So you're not just whiffing on them and then putting that fish down. <laughs> the corn fed. That's one I fish all summer long. Well, awesome. Yeah, it, the, it's an unbelievable collection of flies. Um, I think one of the, the interesting things that I'd be curious to know the answer of is like, you've got some non-conventional looks to some of the bugs. Uh, mostly I'm talking about the dart, uh, the warrior. What's your, what's your mental idea of what elicits a strike with a fish? Um, you know, why, why hot spots are a thing? Why a red tail? Why a full flash body? Like, what, what are you looking for to elicit a strike there? Yeah, who knows, right? That's always situational. I mean, we've all experienced uh, picky tailwater fish or spring creek fish that you can see that has refused your last size 24 mm -hmm. midge pupa on 7x and they're probably not going to eat one of these either but they might you never know but I, I think to me most of the time for 90 percent of my fishing anyway it the ma the real magic when you're nymphing especially when we're talking about some of these wild colored nymphs the real magic to me is getting them down to where the fish are feeding and getting them drifting the right speed. And so having, uh, you know, obviously pattern and color makes a difference, but if you're getting them down in that strike zone and you're drifting them, oops, you're drifting them natural, right? You're, you're moving them dead drift. That is the, the main thing. I think that's the major hurdle most people have to mm -hmm. overcome. And then after that, if you're doing that every drift, then you can play with whether they want something with a red tail or something that's more of a midge pupa, something that's more natural looking. Um, I don't have a real thought process in my head as far as why I would fish one or the other, but there's certainly, as you know, there are triggers to certain flies, certain colors. Some places work really, really well. You know, in, in one river, a red uh, tail, a red tag on something might crush them, and on another drainage, you know, 20 miles away, they may not like it at all. Who knows what the fish are thinking? To me, I like having a collection of flies that vary in size, vary in weight, vary in silhouette and color. And then if you're presenting them right, you kind of you can quickly work out what's working and what's not working. And clearly a lot of confidence in the pattern. Confidence is key, yeah. If you're not confident your fly is going to work, what are you doing, right? What, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're not fishing it very well if you're not confident in it. Uh, and then just real quick, I want to touch outside of the Egan um, portfolio of patterns. We've got some other flies from some other folks that were you know, developed in that same spirit. Um, and just wanted to touch on a couple of the other kind of trending flies from Umpqua that fit within the same kind of category. Yeah, perfect. Well, let's maybe start with the Tasmanian Devil. That is one that uh, we learned about when we were in Tasmania, right? Our, uh, our friend and guide, Max, Maxim Vereshaka, the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> he, Spam in a can. <laughs> He, uh, he showed us a fly that, the, that their team has liked to use and has had a lot of success on, and sure enough, it worked really well. Um, for me, I'm sure you were the same. For me, it worked really well in Tasmania, and it's worked really well yes. here, too. Uh, again, with some crazy color combinations that, it is. again, wouldn't be the standard of what you would think about for Match the Hatch. No, it's another one of those flies that I suggest in the bins all the time to customers, and they look at it and go... Okay, you know, they, they put one or, one. one or two of them in there and then they come back and get a whole bunch, right? Yeah. Who knows, kind of that lucent pink bead, that, uh, that uh, radiant bead with a CDC collar and the hair's ear body, can't go wrong with some hair's ear on there, hot spot tail, tag style nymphs, which mm -hmm. I would call this, the, the darts I would call a tag style nymph as well with kind of a hot spot type of tail. 
Um, they're just very effective. And then you add, you know, the magic of CDC and that hair's ear added with the pink bead. That's a magic fly for sure. That's a confidence fly for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I fish it a lot. I have rows of my boxes. It's a great, great pattern. One of the cool things Umqua does with this one too is we do the varying bead sizes per hook size. So right. if you want, again, that lighter bead for dry dropper, mm -hmm. traditional style fishing, or if you want kind of that deep nymph rig, uh, whether on the Euro rod or under an indicator, you can play with bead weight to yeah. sink your flies too. Yeah, you get a 16 hook with two different bead sizes, a larger and a smaller bead size. It's magic for sure. Helps you get down or not sink your dry, right? Yeah. As the case may be. All right, well, moving on, but in the same vein, uh, the Hustler. Again, a hair's ear type of body, uh, CDC collar. It's got kind of the classic Euro style nymph tail, mm -hmm. Coke de Leon. Uh, more traditional bead color, but uh, with a pearl rib through it. Uh, just one of those flies, again, who knows what it looks like. To me, I think it, it looks most like caddis pupa. Yeah. Um, I think it could also be taken as a small crane fly larva. Um, but the larger sizes, I think Drake a lot too. Drake, I like it. Yes, I hadn't thought of that, but I, I agree. Larger sizes in the dark, especially mm -hmm. a Drake nymph, even a small stone fly. Again, one of those buggy flies that does it really matter what the fish think it is as long as they eat it? No, <laughs> it doesn't, right? And the fish do eat it. That's a great pattern. Uh, by Umqua Tire and former employee Josh Grafham. Mr. JG. Mm-hmm. Well, what else do you like on the table here, Lance? Oh, uh, let's go another dry. Antonio's dry. This is a, kind of a competition, I would call it, style of fly using CDC. To me, coming back to that, you know, C, the advantages of CDC. CDC naturally floats really well. Um, it's, it's a dainty fly, but it, it actually does float quite well. It's easy to see because of the little orange hot spot mm -hmm. in it. Um, and it's really, really easy for fish to get in their mouth. So versus, say, you know, and we're not trying to throw shade on patterns because, you know, comparaduns or parachute style flies are certainly very effective. Yeah, absolutely. And, and standard patterns are going to stay for a long time. But if you're looking for something for really picky fish and something that you want to have confidence the fish are going to be able to easily get in their mouth, this is removing all the rigidity of, of all those parts of those other flies. No, you know, rigid parachute posts, no stiff deer hair, uh, no elk hair, just the soft CDC. It sits pretty low, um, makes a really nice silhouette. Uh, that style of fly for me has started to take over where I used to almost always fish parachutes for most of my mayfly imitations. This kind of Spanish style, Port Portuguese style, if you're Antonio, of, of dry fly uh, has started taking over my mayfly box for sure. Agreed, same here. They're, they're a lot of fun to fish. They land super soft with that kind of, and same with the corn fed. I, I know we didn't touch on that, but the CDC just kind of parachutes things down. Yeah. A real gentle landing. So even if you botch a cast towards a fish, yeah. you don't totally uh, no. splash and sink a, totally. put it down. Um, well, awesome. Thanks so much for talking through some of the different patterns and kind of where they came from. What we want to do now is talk about packaging up some of the patterns and some technique stuff. And I'm going to talk a little bit about techniques specifically for Euro, but then also how those Euro techniques and theories play into just an angler's kit. Um, and they can mix that into dry dropper fishing, streamer fishing, kind of, and take it a lot of different places. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. So diving into some of the technique here, one of the things I'm curious about, like I think Euro, the idea of it, competition fishing, has a really specific set of rules that have influenced how you build your kit and rig your rod and put it all together. But at the same to token, that has a lot of application just for being a better fisherman, increased sensitivity, better strike detection, kind of all of those benefits when it matters and you're, you know, having to measure each and every fish. Um, you know, just for general fishing, I think a lot of that, we all just want a little more success on the water. There's some real advantage to understanding the technique and start to mold it into your own personal fishing. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to me about a little bit of your experience of taking that and how you've adapted some of this stuff for non-competition, but really built that system yeah yeah for me uh you know a lot of the things uh, a lot of people would would put you a competition angler in that box where that's you only do that because of the rules that make you do that and some of that's true but uh for me personally uh you know, nymphing wise 
I feel like I'm most effective, especially as a waiting angler, using a Euro system. So I don't find that I would often go back to many of the rigs that I used to use. Um, Euro systems for me in just everyday angling allow me to fish a greater variety of water types from really skinny water to also very deep water, really narrow pockets, still you know great in runs and riffles and things too. I think a Euro rig is, uh, is less cumbersome than say an indicator and I'm not, again, I don't want to throw shade on anything. I still use an indicator mm -hmm. now and then. I think it's in some cases the best rig. But um, an indicator rig is a little cumbersome. It's hard to cast super accurate with. It's, I think it's best to kind of suspend nymphs at a particular depth for a long period of time versus if you're in a pocket where you just need to get flies in and kind of in, the, in a very narrow pocket or tight to a bank or uh, if you're fishing multiple flies, getting two of them in the exact same seam mm -hmm. is much easier to do with a Euro rig. It's, you don't have the indicator plus flies plus split shot that are all kind of working against each other. You just have two flies that you can kind of maneuver and, and cast around obstacles and, and be a little more precise with. Um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, I think strike detection is probably improved with the Euro system. But uh, competition fishing in general, I would argue, has improved my everyday fishing just because it's, it makes you think outside the box. It makes you fish water you maybe what used to walk right mm -hmm. on by. It forces you to find fish in places where you maybe didn't even look before. Um, I mean, I've, I've been to the Provo with you on busy days, and like, if you're walking with an indicator rig, you're kind of going from A water to A water, those nice big buckets that are on yeah. the Provo that, you know, everyone knows hold fish, and always you're kind of rotating in and out. And, you know, on those busy days, it's so nice with that rig to just have that diversity to walk up and be like, oh, we'll fish the in-between water, we'll fish the good water, We'll fish the next little piece of flat water. Yeah, it makes the whole river kind of fishable um, mm -hmm. versus your rig limiting you to these kind of water types. Totally, yeah. When I used to guide, I'd have uh, clients that show up, and we'd have you know, there's a bunch of cars in the parking lot, and you get to the river, and the first great looking run is taken, and the second one's taken, and you can see four or five anglers mm -hmm. in sight. And I've had clients before like. Do we need to go somewhere else? And you're like, no, 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 we'll be fine. We're not going to fish even where they're fishing. We're, yeah. we're going to fish between those guys and between the, they're not going to hit, we're going to hit all the water they're going to ignore. Mm -hmm. Which is great. And it, it, again, it kind of opens up a lot more and there's, there's plenty of water here locally in Colorado that we do the same thing where it's right. that in between water is some of the better water. Those fish get harassed less. Totally. Um, the technique just works perfectly in there. And, um, you know, I, I think, in that same thought process, if someone wanted to get into this, what are some of the barriers of entry that they need to think about to, to walk in and, and kind of find some success if they wanted to pick up this or start to integrate this? Pick up your own nymphing yeah. particularly? I think the bigger biggest hurdles, uh, people uh, are hesitant, let's say, to want to buy a new rod dedicated to it. Mm. Um, but that's the best way to do it. You know, you, you don't drive a golf ball with a putter, right? You need, you need the right tool. Um, it, it, can you do it with a nine foot five weight? Yeah, it has its limitations, but but you could do it. Um, I think some of the biggest hurdles though are, are just understanding leaders. It's not as simple. It, I should say it hasn't been as simple as going to your fly shop and pulling a nine foot five X off the wall, attaching it to your line and tying a fly on and going. We're trying to make that easier, right? So uh, as you know, we've partnered with Umqua. I partnered with Umqua lately, and we came up with some uh, very visible leader materials that <clears throat> that are just that, they're grab and go. You, you can get them in different diameters, different colors. You can um, grab a leader that all you have to do is add tippet to a tippet ring and tie your flies on and you're ready to, you're ready to fish. Well, let's get into some gear then. Uh, <coughs> and, and specifically the, the new Performex Lance Egan Euro leader um, in three different sizes and three different colors. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I worked with Brent uh, here at Umqua with on this project. Uh, I wanted to have, I wanted to have something that's easy to get people to start. Uh, so we started out with the thickest, uh, the, a very large diameter material that's very visible. So if you have a hard time seeing a Euro rig, it's the most visible. It's also great for floating the cider. If you've watched the videos I put out with Devin Olson and Gilbert Rowley, you've maybe seen uh, a technique we call floating the cider. 
and the thickest leader is perfect for that as well. What's the name of those videos in case people don't know? Modern Nymphing, Modern Nymphing Elevated, or the two Euro Nymphing videos perfect. anyway. Uh, so that leader I call the, our, our entry, you know, Euro Nymphing entry leader. If you're used to the predictable delivery of a standard taper leader and you try and go right to super thin stuff, you're gonna struggle. Uh, they just don't cast as easily. This has a little more directional control, a little more stiffness, a little more mass to push the rig where you want it to go. Once you kind of get used to that leader, we suggest you start trimming down your diameter, right? Getting thinner. Mm -hmm. So then we have kind of a mid diameter, a, a medium diameter, if you will. Um, and all of these are available. You can get the material to tie your own as well. And they're available. Which we've got on, sitting back here. We have here. And they're available in, in different colors too. So if you happen to see the green better than the pink or the orange, you can get them in all the diameters. But the middle leader is more of a, to me, an intermediate Euronympher. Uh, somebody that is, has graduated past this, or maybe isn't using floating the cider as much, maybe not quite ready to go a micro. This is kind of your do it all. It still has, it's thin enough that it reduces sag, but it has a little more predictable delivery than going super, super thin. Um, kind of a transition, if you will. Ideally, I would like to lean most people into you know, working towards the micro leader, the 4X diameter. So this whole leader from your Euro fly line down to your cider is going to be seven thousandths of an inch, which is 4X. That's really thin. It and has. What, what's the advantage of going that? Because that, that sounds crazy to most people, I think. What's the advantage of going like a 4X leader? Yeah, the advantage, as you know, is, uh, is less sag and the ability to use uh, lighter flies and allow them to get down and fish farther away. So you're telling me the weight of this little thin leader creates sag when I'm fishing 20, 30 feet away. It absolutely does, yes, and you know this. <laughs> I do. Being, he's being coy again. This, uh, yeah, a little bit of sag. Now, sag can be a good thing, can help with strike detection, but it's pulling your rig towards you slightly, right? And even though it's, they're all just nylon materials, they don't have a lot of density, but they do have a little bit of mass to them, a little bit of weight. So. The heavier, the thicker the leader is, as you send it out there, the more sag it's mm -hmm. going to have, more pull, it's going to have kind of heading back towards you're, your rod. You're artificially pulling your flies uh, unintentionally with some of those heavier. Towards you, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so going micro allows you to eliminate as much of that sag as possible. And at a 4X diameter, that's where I find my happy medium being, you can get lighter, of course, you can get heavier. Uh, but if I'm using 5X, 5.5, 6, 7X tippets, Having a leader that's just stronger than that is my happy medium as far as uh, keeping it micro, reducing sag, fishing far away, but not giving up on breaking strength and blowing up your whole leader. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about how these are built a little bit because the rest of the items we've got on the table here are all the elements to build this leader. And I think they're, they're pretty darn critical when we talk about this technique um, of your own nymphing. Yeah, so the materials, are, uh, you, you have high visibility materials that are all copolymer Japanese nylon. They're high, very high quality, very good strength to diameter ratios. Um, they all release memory very easily. And so you can find, if you're building your own, you can find the color that you see the best. Correct. Build it uh, in your favorite color and in your favorite diameter. And then you can add the cider material. The cider materials that we have from Umqua are now available in a bi-color or tri-color mm -hmm. option and in several colorways as well. And so, diameters too, again, if you're building out a variety of liters. Matching diameters, you got it. So there's all kinds of variability there. And then we also have tippet rings. All of these liters are built with a tippet ring on the terminal end. So again, all you gotta do is attach them to your flat, your Euro line and that, attach some tippet to the, the tiny little tippet ring and what, you're off and running. What won't they find that's on a normal leader that isn't on these? <laughs> Good question. We purposely left off the perfection loop um, that is on most tapered leaders. We did that on purpose uh, because you don't want a loop-to-loop -loop connection going in and out of your guides. On a Euro system, the leaders are so long that as you make a cast and take up the slack on every single drift, your line-to-leader connection goes in and out of your rod rings, your rod guides, nearly every cast, if not every cast. Mm -hmm. And having a loop-to-loop -loop connection, as convenient as it is, to attach it, that's where the convenience stops. That's correct. It does not slide through the guides very well. So. Could you add one to it? Yeah, you could. We don't suggest you do. We suggest you nail knot it or needle nail knot or super glue splice or whip a loop in the end of your Euro line and just clinch knot right to the little end of the loop. The, that loop will be much more narrow and then just with a clinch knot on there instead of two loop to loops, mm -hmm. it'll go through the guides much better. So you got to come up with a little more uh, 
I don't know what the right, what the right word is, maybe strenuous, a little more, a little less. There's a little preparation on the front end to make this really smooth for all of those moments you have out on the water. Yeah, it's not as pain-free as a standard taper leader, but it's so worth it to allow your line leader to go in and out of the guides. You're also going to bring the leader into the guides to land every fish, and with the Euro system, we're hoping you're landing lots of fish. Um, the last component that comes off the end of these that's not included on these leaders is tippet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's a big... Uh, um, misunderstanding about why you're choosing finer diameter tippets than um, than a standard, right? You, you can certainly catch fish on 4 and 5x all day, but um, why would you go lighter in some of these scenarios than 4 or 5x? Yeah, I, I, I guess building on what you said there, I think you made a good point. To me, I don't think that uh, the tippet diameter is something that's keeping fish from eating it for visibility purposes. Personally, this is the, the world according to Lance. Just use this as you may. <laughs> but the, I don't think that the trout are eating a fly on 7x versus 5x because they can't see the 7x. Uh, the reason I think that is you'll never convince me that on your fly, if you have 5 or 7x tied here and you have a non-clear hook sticking out of the fly, why would they focus on 5X here and not eat your fly when there's a bronze or black nickel or choose sure. your color of hook sticking out a part of the fly? Why would they overlook that and not look at the tippet? To me, and I'm sure you agree, thinner tippet helps you mostly achieve depth quicker when you're nymphing. And, and, and why, though? I think that's the, the, <clears throat> the big critical question. Why get there quicker? Yeah, why does it help you get... Oh, it just has less surface area, right? There's... In a water column, you have the slowest water, generally speaking, near the bottom and faster currents near the surface, and you need to overcome that, that vertical drag, I like to call it, going through the water column. And so a thinner material, if you have you know, 7x instead of 4x going through there, there's a lot less influence of those vertical currents on your tippet. So your flies are able to get down. And then the other part of that, in my opinion, is that your fly, no doubt, drifts more naturally on a thinner material, 7x, 6x, 5x, whatever it is. Subtle pulses in the water that... Yeah, it just it's tied to something that allows the fly to just drift willy-nilly instead of, you know, to something stiff and cable. thick. Cable, yeah, 3x, 4x is too stiff for most nymphs. A really large nymph, a giant salmon fly nymph, yeah, you could probably get away with it. Yeah. Throwing 3x on a size, you know, 14 nymph or a 16 nymph, can you catch fish on it? Yeah, you can, but you could catch a lot more if you went a little thinner. Well, cool. I think that helps really kind of build out this. Is there anything on the technique side that you'd leave anglers with as they start to explore this and, and integrate it into their other angling? Uh, one more trick on these. I would suggest if you're Euro-nymphing, I would suggest fluorocarbon tippet. Okay. Uh, if you whether you use the Phantom X or the Deceiver X, either one works great. Uh, but fluorocarbon is a teeny bit more dense. It's more abrasion resistant. And again, I'm not so worried about the clarity as I am um, allowing that to get break through the surface tension and just keep in contact with those flies, get them deeper quicker. It's not sinking, it's not pulling your fly down, it's just able to break that, that meniscus uh, a tiny bit faster. I notice when I fish nylon, because you can find nylon that's very, very strong per diameter, but when I nymph with nylon, I'm, it, it always bothers me watching how slow like the fly has to pull the nylon the through the surface. Sink rate. Yeah. yeah. And the fluoro just doesn't have to do that as much. I think the, the one thing I just wanted to touch on that makes the whole system, I think, really unique to there, yes, there is a rule that it has to be a single leader, right? Which indicates the tags. We, you touched on it earlier, mm -hmm. but what are some of the advantages to fishing off a tag? Yeah, so tag ends, um, a dropper system, we would call it, whether you're fishing an indicator rig or a Euro rig, or for me, even dries, multiple dries, um, fishing streamers. I fish on tags as well. Uh, I think it's an overlooked part of fly fishing. Uh, it, it, most people are used to tying, you know, if you're tying two flies, they tie one to the eye of the hook and one to the bend, mm -hmm. or maybe two to the eye. And whatever you do there, that first fly has two pieces of tippet tied to it that doesn't allow it to move very naturally. And especially if you're tying to the bend of the hook, then you've got one, you have one problem where the fish have to come from the exact right angles to get that flag. So they come from the front or the back, they run into tip it. Where if you have a tag in, so a tag in meaning you have your main line coming down, you tie a triple surgeon's knot, you leave a tag, tie a fly on there, and then have your other fly down here, your point fly, that tag allows fish to come from nearly any angle except for straight in front of it uh, to eat that fly. It also allows that fly to drift more naturally. If you're stripping streamers, it allows the streamers to swim more naturally. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I like to fish two streamers a lot when I'm stripping them and allowing that, that first fly a lot more motion. 
kind of the same idea as, as when people like to put loop knots on flies. It's just every little bit that you like to do to add, you know, to give yourself a little little extra edge. Add the life to add the... a little life to the fly. It makes a difference. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, dries. I fish three dries on lakes a lot. In Utah, we're allowed to fish three dries. I think Colorado as well. Mm -hmm. Not every place can you do that or three flies. I mean. But we'll fish the top two dry flies on tags, and then of course the terminal one just on the terminal or the point fly on the terminal end of the tippet, and that allows the fish to get at the flies easier. They can stand out from the line a little more. Uh, it's it's a really effective way to fish, and those dropper tags. Uh, once you get used to tying that triple surgeon's knot, or if you didn't want to tie it, if you tie a tippet ring and tie tags off of the tippet rings. You can do it lots of ways, but once you get used to rigging that way, you know, think of if you want to change, if you're tying eyed and then bend to your first fly, if you want to change that fly, you got to cut and retie two knots. So instead, you just tie a tag end, you leave that, and if you want to change that fly, you tie one knot, and you leave your other fly in place. It's, it's more efficient. It allows a better drift. I think it's a superior presentation. Sweet. Um, well... I think that gives everyone a lot to dive into. Um, if they have further questions, where are they able to find you? I'm at Fly Fish Food uh, most days of the week, so you can stop in the shop or you can hit us up online. I'm on uh, social media, Lance Egan on Facebook and at Lance Egan Fly Fishing on Instagram. Uh, that's the easiest places probably to get me. Otherwise, hopefully I run into you on the water. That's always the best place. That's the best. Um, well, Lance, this has been awesome. Uh, we're super appreciative that you yeah. took the time to sit down and talk through a lot of this stuff, help demystify it, help anglers integrate this stuff. Um, I certainly hope it brings some folks some extra success. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, stay tuned for the next episode of Flies 4, and make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done so to our YouTube channel. And again, Lance, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.